Welcome everyone to this webinar by the UN Women Training Center's Community of Practice on our Beijing Plus 25 report. Um, today we're going to look back at 25 years of training for gender equality. And um, this is the second webinar that we've hosted in 2020. And this is an opportunity for us to ex discuss, exchange and share knowledge on training for gender equality. And I'm very honored now to hand over to the chief of our training center, Clemencia Munoz Tamayo, and she's going to take you through uh, a bit of an introduction, and then we will hand over to our uh, the author of our report. Thank you, Clementine. Thank you, Ruya. Uh, greetings, and everyone from New York, and and welcome to this uh, second webinar of the year, as Ruya was saying. And as you all know, our topic today is Beijing Plus Twenty Five Review Report from a Training Perspective. Um, these online discussions are mechanisms for us in the training center as training practitioners to continually discuss, exchange and share knowledge as Ruya was mentioning, and also to nurture our community for collective learning across the world. At the UN Training Center, we believe very strongly in creating knowledge and sharing learning in a participatory manner. I will introduce a little bit the training center before introducing our speakers. Um, so a little bit about the training center. Uh, we are the training arm of UN Women's and we strengthen skills and knowledge on gender equality through transformative training that enables the UN agencies, the government, civil society and other partners to realize commitments to gender equality, women's empowerment and women's rights. So what do we do exactly? Next. Um, at the UN Women Training Center, we are mandated to develop and deliver online self-paced and in the past face-to-face -face, uh, trainings uh, scheduled and upon demand. And of course, the online are self-paced. Uh, as of this year, we have offered uh, 89 courses, continuing courses in four languages, English, Spanish, French, and Arabic, and in all modalities. Of course, these days, 90% of all are online or moderated online. We also develop practical training tools, such as training manuals, capacity and needs assessment, evaluation, quality assurance, and topical manuals and other tools as well. The training center, also contributes to the theoretical and methodological advances in this growing, small but still growing, field of training for gender equality through analysis, knowledge products, and participatory discussions, which feed into the theory and vice versa. It's a virtuous loop. Um, we also provide technical assistance throughout the training cycle to support quality standards uh, of our uh, audiences with the tools the, that just were mentioned. And uh, finally, we have e-learning facilities. Just one is the community of practice, but we also have the e-learning campus in general, which is an open uh, public uh, site uh, on training for gender equality. We have currently over 100,000 users uh, and participants from 196 countries and territories around the world. <coughs> Going into what brings you us here today, we also, uh, and as I mentioned, we we have uh, or we develop knowledge products um, because this is a field in the making. So alongside with the training courses, we aim at contributing to this field, generating cutting edge knowledge products and tools. Uh, this practice informed evidence-based research and knowledge products are what guide our work, especially the course design and delivery. Um, our research knowledge products and practical tools inform our practice of training for gender equality and vice versa. I was already referring to the virtuous uh, loop. And uh, this is our experience in practice informs our tools and knowledge and creating this virtual cycle between knowledge creation and practice. As our knowledge strengthens our practice and our practice feeds into our knowledge, we're able to deliver better 
more contextualized, more effective training for gender equality that contributes to advancing uh, gender transformative pro programming. We practice reflective reflectivity in our practice, and this feeds into the knowledge products developed. Following publications, we run webinars on, on key topics, and all our products have been updated in order to incorporate the ideas from these debates and include the latest cutting edge literature and debates on training for gender equality. Five years ago, when uh, we hit Beijing plus 20, we developed our first research report on training for gender equality based on the Beijing review process. And it was called Training for Gender Equality 20 Years On. This was our first step in surveying training for gender equality in the Beijing review process and the broader literature. The overall aim of that paper was to advance knowledge and understanding on training for gender equality to develop strategies for moving forward in this field. Um, we also saw what had worked well to that date and what challenges remain based on the substantive empirical evidence and the rigorous analysis as reported by all governments and regions. And this is very much this, the same approach that we will we followed with this latest Beijing Plus 25 review, which is going to be presented today, um, and uh, which is called Training for Gender Equality, a review for Beijing Plus 25. This uh, report uh, explores how training for gender equality has evolved from Beijing Platform for Action in 95 to the present day. As we mark, you all know we have marked this year, the 25th anniversary, the paper aims to strengthen understandings of training as a strategy to achieve transformative cha change for gender equality. Mapping out key developments, the paper reflects on what has worked well and what challenges remain based also on the previous paper. And it identifies a decline in gender transformative approaches to training since 2005 in favor of more transactional and instrumental approaches. In many cases, power relations are not explicit, ta explicitly tackled in training design, implementation, and evaluation. The paper offers recommendations in line with the Secretary's General Report on the 25-year review by thematic areas and by cross-cutting priorities for action. Ultimately, it argues that training should be acknowledged as a key component of gender transformative change. So before I hand it on, I'd like to introduce uh, our, our speakers today. We're very honored to have a large audience and two panelists with us today, uh, Dr. Lucy Ferguson and Professor Caroline Mosser, Mosser. Dr. Lucy Ferguson is a consultant to the Training Center and is a specialist on gender equality and women's empowerment. As a consultant for the Training Center, she has written extensively using the feminist pedagogical principles and working towards training that is reflective, focused on process and grounded in the transformative potential of participatory training encounters. She has worked with several international organizations, including the UN Volunteers, the Commonwealth Secretariat, UNDP, and WTO. Her latest book is Gender Training, a Transformative Tool for Gender Equality. Lucy is also the author of our review report of Beijing that she will be presenting today. Professor Caroline Moser is a urban social, social anthropologist and social political specialist. She has more than 40 years of experience on the interrelationship between theory and practice around the three main urban development themes of gender, asset accumulation and violence and conflict. Caroline is an emeritus professor at the University of Manchester in the United Kingdom and has held many prestigious academic positions in the past, including as a lecturer at the London School of Economics, at New School in New York, 
at UCLA, at US, UCL, sorry, where she initiated global training on gender planning. She has worked with international organizations, including the World Bank as lead specialist for social development in Latin America and policy related research think tanks, including the Overseas Development Institute and the Brookings Institutions, among many others. Lucy, Caroline, welcome to this webinar and the floor is yours. So happy to have you two here. Thank you, Clemencia. Thank you for the introduction. I'm also really happy to be here and um, just wanted to say that it's really lovely to see all your messages coming through, to see where you all are in the world and feel slightly uh, more connected and less disjointed as many of us are feeling in these times, I think. So it's lovely to, uh, to imagine you connecting from, from different parts of the world. Thanks for the introduction to the paper. Um, uh, here's the link for reviewing the paper if you haven't already had a chance to review it. Um, you can see that there's the full report and then we also produce two infographics. Today I want to just introduce you to a broad overview of some of the key findings and arguments and as well pinpoint some of the questions that I think Caroline's going to uh, lead us through helping us think through some of the bigger questions and issues here. When we started the paper, we wanted to look at three main questions. How has training for gender equality developed since the Beijing Platform for Action to now in 2020? What has worked well and what challenges remain? And the point that Clemencia has already uh, mentioned about this idea is between the difference between transformative and transactional training. I'd just like to touch on that slightly. Um, what do we mean by transformative training for gender equality? Uh, we envisage at the training center, we envisage a kind, a type of training, which is not primarily focused, not only focused on skills acquisition and development, although clearly that's a, a very important part of what we do, but also we're interested in moving beyond technical understandings and technocratical understandings. And this means that we understand that uh, in order to be effective, that gender training needs to be political and contested and grounded in feminist pedagogical principles and practices. We invite you to read our paper on um, feminist pedagogical principles and practices if you want to know more about that. And also we believe that this should be embedded in a broader commitment to gender transformative change. So we don't see training as um, a silver bullet or really as something that should happen in isolation. It's something that's a much part of a much broader process. So this paper, as, I've, as we've said, is concerned about uh, trying to review how training has been framed and conducted and to what extent has that been transformative as set out here and to what extent has it been transactional. By transactional, um, I mean morely focused on skills acquisition and development and gender training primarily focused on what benefits can be got for that for other areas of development. So I'm going to launch a quick poll In your experience of training for gender equality, either as a trainer or as a participant in training or as a commissioner of training, have you found it to be more closer to the transformative approach that we discussed or closer to the transactional or technocratic approach? I think a lot of people are responding to this question. We have 259 attendees with us right now and 149, basically one every second is answering this question. So I think we should give them another uh, couple of seconds. So sure. far it looks like transformative is winning out, but transactional is following quite close behind. So um, we'll, we'll launch the, the poll just now. And we're up to 180. Should I finish now, Rui? Yes, we've got a fairly big sure. sample. Let's finish now. Um, I think actually uh, transactional, it's it's exactly equal because um, we've made the error of putting two transactional answers 
So we have exactly 50-50. Oh, sorry. Yeah, the third one was supposed to be not sure. Okay. <laughs> yes, 50-50. So um, I think that's a very interesting starting point for our debate. Thank you very much for voting, for participating. Um, that suggests that maps quite clearly what our findings have been really in the in the um, in this review process. Uh, briefly to set out how training was conceptualized in the original platform for action. There was uh, concentrated uh, applied in different ways in different critical areas of concern poverty the environment the economy and the environment will primarily focus on skills training for women education and the girl child focused on training on non-discrimination gender sensitive training for personnel was very clearly set out for health violence and human rights however uh, we don't really have in the platform for action, a very clear definition of what the impact of training might be or how it would be monitored and evaluated. So we started in a sense from, from a, a point of disadvantage because we, we, there, there was no clear path in the platform for action for what training really, what the, really the role and the impact of training would be. In our previous review that Clemencia mentioned, which, which reviewed from the five-year review process to the 20-year review process, uh, we made the following brief conclusions that 20 years on, we raised concerns that institutional mechanisms, area H of the platform for action, were still not in place in order to provide gender transformative training and therefore gender mainstreaming. Uh, we'd also seen that the context shifted from transformative approaches, very much grounded in a gender mainstreaming approach, to more transactional and instrumental approaches within individual critical areas of concern, as opposed to a more holistic approach embedded within gender mainstreaming. Also, as you can see from one of the infographics, the number of times that training is mentioned in the report uh, drops drastically as time develops, especially um, compared to the five year review compared to the 20 year review, we, we find a lot fewer mentions of training itself. Um, for those of you who are familiar with the new reporting framework, um, I know this is very difficult to read, sorry, but I'm just explaining what this says because you can find it in the report. Um, the 12 critical areas of concern have been reorganized in order to fit into these key priority areas, and which at that time I'm going to present this presentation because that's how we presented it in the report. So these relate to key areas of critical areas of concern from the platform for action and also the sustainable development goals. So that's a new change. And I, and I think that as I went through the review, I found that socially also affected in some ways the, the transformative potential of the, uh, of, the of Beijing, because by changing the focus on different areas, some aspects have been minimized. So there are interesting questions for debate there as well. I'm going to present these now. So I, I apologize that that's not very easy to read, but you can find it in the report. So again, this is not really for you to read every word, but just to give you an idea that we, that we wanted to present a visual representation of all the different ways that training is referred to and described. This is another of the infographic materials that we promised. So you can see all of these. I'll just pick out a couple here. Gender equality and human rights training for teachers and educators. Um, training for support service providers, medical professionals and law enforcement officers to tackle discrimination, institutional discrimination of people from LGBTI communities. Uh, and this goes on, we really wanted to kind of capture, give a flavor of the really uh, in-depth descriptions given of the different kinds of training. Um, digital empowerment programs and training, uh, prevention training, for teachers and educators. So that's an example of the kind of broad range of things that we're, activities that we're talking about when we talk about training in this piece of research. So now I want to go through the different priority areas set out in the Secretary General's report for Beijing plus 25. And then of course the regional reports. Um, the first area is inclusive development, shared prosperity and decent work. We identified primarily here a transactional or instrumental approach. And it's very much about 
strategies to increase the presence, i.e. The, the, the number of women working in technology. So this is focusing on mentoring, unconscious bias training, but the onus is very much on individuals, i.e. women to change, rather than shifting workplace cultures that exclude women and, and have inherent gender biases. Uh, so we kind of identified this as a bit of a missed opportunity to deploy training for gender equality to transform uh, education and workplaces working on um, uh, technology, engineering and mathematics and science in STEM education. The second key area, poverty eradication, social protection and social services. Um, we did find gender sensitive training here in order to encourage women, particularly into STEM education and training. The digital aspect of the STEM aspect is a huge theme going out plus, throughout plus 25. And uh, of course, now that we're living in a very, very digitalized world, those of us who have access to the digital world, uh, that's becoming more and more embedded. However, primarily, again, the approach here is transactional and instrumental. There's not very much discussion about the relationship between training and formal education, the impact of technology on gender training, for example, through online training, which we've, which we've had to uh, advance in exponentially this year. However, we can identify some gender transformative training in this area in some Latin American and Caribbean countries, working on transforming work environments in innovative and, and transformative ways. The next in, in the area of freedom from violence, stigma and stereotypes, training features very strongly. Uh, mostly a look at the focus on gender stereotypes in the media, gender stereotypes in judicial systems, and this can all be very helpful when it's part of longer term gender transformative strategies. However, at this stage, we don't have enough research to know really uh, the impact of such trainings on gender stereotypes and whether they have um, been embedded in broader processes of transformative change. So there's much more interesting questions to look at there. Excuse me. The next area is participation, accountability and gender responsive institutions. Um, this is, as I mentioned before, the area of institutional mechanisms was a very important aspect of the, uh, the platform for action and subsequent reviews. That the resources, both human and financial resources, were in place to ensure that gender mainstreaming was taken seriously and implemented in a sustainable way. Uh, however, in, the, in this report, it's very hard to find work specifically on institutional mechanisms. And this is concerning because with the rearranging of the reporting mechanisms, there was no direct accountability for this area. So um, this kind of slightly dropped out of the debate, I would say a little. And I think this is concerning because we know, those of us who work in gender mainstreaming and in institutions, that strong institutions and procedures are essential for implementing, implementing gender responsive change. And there is also a lot of discussion on training in women's leadership, training in women's, women's participation, but we argue that this continues to be predominantly targeted at women, uh, women's leadership skills, rather than at transforming the gender structures, behaviours and cultures that lead to those, the exclusion of women from those institutions. Uh, peaceful and inclusive society sees, uh, we know that there's a lot of training that goes on in this area and it's often training is substantively linked to gender equality strategies in post conflict and post crisis environments and societies. Gender equality training has also been provided for military and diplomatic staff focusing very strongly on uh, kind of transformative aspects transforming gender stereotypes challenging roles. Uh, so we argue that this broadly reflects a transformative approach in this area due to the way that these pro training programs are embedded within broader change processes. In terms of environmental conservation, climate action and resilience building, uh, this is an emerging area for training for gender equality. The majority of the training in this area appears to have adopted a transactional and instrumental approach, which is about how can we harness women's contribution to environmental action? How can we harness women's knowledge for sustainable development and uh, climate action? However, there is uh, some evidence of an emerging gender equality approach to climate change training. 
and uh, we can be optimistic that that is a, is a transformative area for training. And uh, we just argue here that it's really important that this is developed in a systematic manner in this area, particularly given the, the climate crisis and the need to, to make sure that the climate response is, is gender transformative. The two cross-cutting themes are human rights and the girl child. Uh, we weren't really able to identify much of a gender transformative approach here. And um, this is concerning, especially given ongoing violations of women's and girls' human rights worldwide. And we're also now beginning to think of the impact of the current pandemic on human right, women's human rights violations. So uh, we need to, to, be, to make sure that this comes back to the forefront. That's an overview of the main findings. Um, we now have the, uh, another infographic this isn't for you to read, but just to see uh, an example and you can go and look at these uh, for depending on the area that you work in that you're most interested in. We pick out examples of different kinds of transformative trainings that have been conducted in each region. So you can go, you can look at the, the, the maps by region and find out some of the main initiatives that we, that we picked out from the review. We also developed six key recommendations. Um, they are can be found in the in, infographic. So I'm not going to talk too much about those now, because again, uh, we really hope that you will use the infographics that you will share them and, and the report as well. Um, the the recommendations map onto the findings. That's the first set there. And the second set here. Um, the final point I will just, um, just elaborate, acknowledge training for gender equality as a key component of gender transformative change in its own right, embedded within broader change programs. Um, what I really wanted to do to finish my presentation and um, pass over to Caroline and also allow for some discussion, uh, there's three main arguments that I'd like to to, to put across from our findings from the paper. So number one, training should be acknowledged as a key component of gender transformative change. Number two, training can be a transformative process in its own right. Uh, Clemencia used the word encounter, and I think that's a very useful way of thinking about training as a, as a transformative encounter, yet only when it's embedded within broader change programs. And finally, as the training centre, we argue that it's, it's urgent to reclaim the transformative potential of training to contribute to gender equality across all critical areas of concern and not focus just on skills training, particularly not just skills training for women, but rather to be tackling the structures and cultures and practices that, that perpetuate gender inequality. So thank you very much. Uh, we'd be happy to take questions on the paper at the end. We shared the link at the beginning and we will be recording the webinar so, and, and sharing that on our YouTube channel. So I'm very honored that uh, Caroline Moser accepted to be with us today. And she's going to now uh, discuss a few points on the paper and then Ria will moderate the, uh, the question and answer session. So thank you very much, Caroline. I'll pass to you now. Okay, sorry, I'll start my video. Okay, so I'd like to begin by, by thanking um, Lucy and the UN Women team. It's an extraordinary honor to um, present some comments. Um, I um, undertook a lot of gender training in the 1980s and the 1990s, and I introduced gender training uh, methodologies to a range of institutions. So it's a privilege to be invited to make some brief comments today. And I really don't want to, it's a very extensive report, um, full of detail. Um, and I just want to highlight some, some issues that I think may be helpful for us. Um, given the fact that we're now entering the third decade of training, I think this is incredibly important to review what's going on. And what I want to do in this very brief review is to discuss two issues, the important shifts or changes that the report A raises and further ways forward. 
thinking a little bit about mm. the background context, um, there's no, as Lucy said, the, the problem we have is that there's no definition of how the impact of training on gender equality can be monitored and evaluated. And this is highly complex. Um, people can talk about the happiness quotient, which is the immediate satisfaction of people who've been through training to the long term impact. When I was asked to do this, I returned to a book that I wrote on gender planning and to Mary Anderson's 1991 evaluation model on inputs and outputs, her distinctions between the contents, the methods, the focus of training, etc. And the outputs, which really are around the changes to participants the institutional changes and external impacts. And these are very comprehensive. What happens in this report is that it prioritizes the discourse, the changes in the discourse around gender and the rationale for training. And as has been said before, it uses the concepts of transformation, very broadly defined, a term, by the way, which in 1995, when the Beijing Platform for Action was written, was very aspirational rather than operational. So this is a term that has come more online in the last two years than it did at that time. Also making a dualist distinction, which we've heard about before, between transformative and transactional training. And I think it's very interesting, the poll you did, which comes up with 50 percent of each of them. So turning to what the report identifies in terms of shifts, very interesting. The first one is on objectives and associated terminology. So there's a shift from gender mainstreaming training, which is talked about in terms of gender awareness, gender sensitivity, gender equality, gender impact, a lot of different terms, to gender transformative training, which can be, as Lucy has said, both an approach to training, but also an outcome from training. And finally, what we now hear is a very different language about gender responsive training. So there are very different approaches and each has differences in terms of how far it is transformative or transactional. Um, so, so that's the first thing. The second thing that I think is very interesting in the report is changes in institutional mechanisms. We have differences in commitment and associated programs and resource allocations between governments, we early training was very much envisaged across all ministries. Then we had the introduction of national machineries of gender equality, some very remarkable, others with less impact. And by 2010, UN Women was created, which was previously UNIFEM, with the UN Women Training Center with a specific mandate on training. So here we have different types of institutional mechanisms, all focusing on the same issue of gender training. Now, if we turn to the analysis, really what we are focusing on, as you've said, have you heard before, is how far gender transformative approaches have declined. And very quickly, as the report says, we've got a change from 2005, when it was at its peak, to 2015, where it was slowly declining to 2020 when it's mentioned far less. So this is really the trend that we've been seeing and we have to try and understand why does the UN, why has this happened? Well, the thing we have to recognize is that the UN doesn't operate in a vacuum and nor does the UN Women's Training Center. And we have to think about what are the externalities, I think, that could have influenced these shifts and declines. I'm talking less now about what's going on inside the UN system, but what's been going on outside. And first and most important in a way has been a shift in prioritization of the importance of gender training. In 1995, this was seen as a panacea. It was a quick fix. It was a way to get things done very fast. And over the next 10 years, what happened was that many development institutions which witnessed a failure of training to deliver its perceived fast delivery potential. This is the issue that if it's a bit of training, it's a quick fix, we can get it done. So there was a decline in expectations associated with a decline in budgets and institutions. 
A second issue which is very important in, in, in this shift was the critique and rejection of gender training by many mm. Northern and Southern feminist scholars uh, who began to see this as training as a ubiquitous problem because of the dumbing down and the technification that went on with online courses and with, with the quick uh, delivery of very short courses and the real lack of understanding of the profound issues. Um, and the outcome of this has been in many uh, bilaterals and NGOs that they have really declined in their training. A second influence is the change in the macroeconomic and political environment. If we think of the 1990s and the structural adjustment crises and the return to neoliberal development agendas, many institutions that had a, a gender and development approach returned to a women and development approach, approach with fundamental questions about how far they no longer address structural and power power relations in gender. Finally, the far greater recognition in the last 25 years of the complexity of gender issues. From, in 1995, we could say that women were really seen rather as an undifferentiated other. And now we recognize things like the limitations of binary conceptualizations of gender, the, the critical importance of intersectionality and diversity. And such complexity in turn requires greater competence for training, more time, budgets, etc. And in what has happened in many cases is people have started to introduce what they call diversity training in some of the bilaterals. So let's quickly now finish by turning to the way forward in the current UN climate of commitment. I would, sorry, I wanted to say that in the current climate, the UN's commitment to gender training, I think needs to be applauded. This is, this is one of the institutional structures around the world which recognizes still as, is, as witnessed by this report. But I think what, if we're thinking forward, it's useful possibly to work more the analysis of sector level because there are differences, as Lucy pointed out, in in terms of how they they have approached training they are not homogeneous and the question we ask ourselves is are the determinants internal or external to the un system so i want to quickly illustrate this with a couple of examples first of all if we look at inclusive development the emphasis on women's economic empowerment, as Lucy said, focuses on individual women rather than structural changes in gender relations. And this has gone on not only um, in country development, but by bilaterals, by multilaterals. And if we think of philanthropic institutions, um, this has happened as well, that Nike's work with the girl child and so on. If we look at the health sector, it's still very traditional and violence against women training tending to focus as victims rather than transforming gender structures and behaviors. On the other side, let's think about peace and development and broadly reflect, which broadly reflects a transformative approach. Why, why does this happen, we ask ourselves? Is it the influence of extensive civil society contestation and negotiation? Is it media pressure around failures of INGOs such as Oxfam in post-earthquake Haiti or peacekeeper violations in Africa? These are important questions for me in answering why are some of these sectors more transformative than others? And it shows the importance of cutting edge new gender agendas of public debates, of media debates, and above all, about the role of civil society institutions. So finally, to end, I want to turn to, um, oops, next slide, to, to the future, to, oh, we seem to have lost my last slide. Um, okay, I'll just talk my last slide through. Um, so finally, I want to think about where do we go with this, the future of institutions, uh, the work of the UN Women's Training Centre and training in national machinery, future issues, are there 
Is there less resistance to transformative training on newer cutting edge issues such as human rights? And finally, the future of co-production of gender training with social movements, with social networks and with civil society institutions. Thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you so much, Carolyn. Um, I think we're gonna change to my screen now because we've been getting lots of um, excellent questions from you all. And I'm just going to change the screen and... Great, so these are questions for both uh, Caroline and Lucy, and I'm gonna put them up on screen now so you'll be able to see them. And uh, there are a couple of more technical questions and a couple of broader ones. And uh, so if you want to look at the screen and see what um, the first one, I think, is mostly about um, for Lucy. So that's specifically about the report was any data on training outcomes and impact reviewed? And if so, what were the findings? OK, do you want to go one by one, Ria? How do you want to take the questions? Sure. Maybe we can start one by one. OK. Um, well, I think that in order to do that, we need a much more extensive research project. The main methodology for this review was uh, country level reports, regional reports, and the overall secretary general report. So that's a huge amount of uh, material, but it, they didn't, we didn't review any specific um, reports on the training that's been conducted. It does need to be done. Um, this would really be required to, I think the way to do this would be to select the specific initiatives that we find most interesting or promising, contact the people in charge of them and ask to look at uh, their monitoring and evaluation processes or contact a government ministry that's been developing an extensive program and ask to access their evaluation materials so I think it's something that would be excellent to do but it isn't information that that on at this kind of level is is available on, a, on any large scale but thanks for the question and yes I think that we should do it definitely. Can I just add that um, I think this could be a really powerful recommendation for the future that you the UN Women's Training Centre itself designs a type of um, evaluation methodology that could be used so that the next time round we have much more information. I mean, I think it's a real challenge, but I think even in my own work on gender training, this has been a really complex, complicated issue that we have not really been able to measure. Yeah, we do have, thanks Caroline, we do have a lot, we have produced a lot of work on gender transformative evaluation of training for gender equality feminist evaluation, we have a handbook, we have methods, we have tools, but I think that the, the, the question about standardization of evaluation of, of, of training would be a, a big project and a worthwhile project that if we could get some pilot governments and institutions on board to work on that, and then we could start to have a comparative uh, study of the impact. But unless we're all using a similar methodology, it's difficult to be able to compare impact and we also need to measure it at different at different times. But it's certainly something that we're working on as the training center, those kind of those to try and get a, a, some guidelines for gender transformative evaluation. Okay. Great, maybe we can move on to a second question, which is, I think would be interesting to hear from both of you. Um, what aspects do the most resistances appear in? Which I think Magali wants to know, um, what are the principal resistances that you identified uh, to training? Is that discussed at all in the report and in general in your experiences? You want to begin? Sure. Um, I think that it's important to acknowledge that the reporting exercise is in itself almost a showcasing of the best practices and the most promising things that have been done in each country. So um, the documents reviewed for this aren't so much a critical reflexive review of what's missing, but rather uh, an overview of what has been done 
and then um, the kind of the key recommendations of what's left to be done in line with the expectations of the platform for action and the sustainable development goals. In terms of working on resistances, that's something that, that I'm sure Caroline and I can both speak to in terms of resistances to gender mainstreaming. Um, I think that there's an interesting point about resistances in the reporting process. For example, we can think about which countries uh, submit a very short report, which institutions uh, produce a very in-depth uh, critical report. I think there are many interesting aspects that can be that can be looked at there. Um, but I think the question of resistance is perhaps I will leave for the moment if that's okay, because um, it's such a big point and uh, we'll come back to it if there are any more more specific points on it, because uh, it's a it's a huge it's a huge area. Can I can I just add that I recent I've I've been struggling with this issue as well for a long time and I I've re wrote a rather um, um, a sort of article about the one of the tensions exists that exists and it adds on to what Lucy's saying is between gender scholars who critique what's going on mm -hmm. and gender practitioners who have to work uh, on in the field, on the ground, and cope on a daily basis. I think it's a very interesting and very healthy tension, but it can also be one that results in quite a lot of resistance. So I think it's not just the externalities out there, it's also pe people who, women mainly, who are working on gender issues. And, and it's quite contentious and quite complicated, but I think it's worth noting. Yeah, I mean, a, the, a point that, that um, perhaps we didn't discuss so much, Caroline, but the demographics of who is a gender trainer and a gender expert as well may have changed over these 25 years. We might have been started with, uh, with a core group of diehard feminists, and now we know that many gender trainers or gender experts don't even call themselves feminists. So we've got a much broader profile of people doing this gender training. It is a big business, there's no doubt about it, especially as we expand into diversity training. So I think that we have many interesting internal resistances and contradictions, even among those of us who believe that we're all working on the same, on the same aspects, which I think is why uh, we are very clear in our work that we're talking about transformation and that we're talking about uh, feminist politics and feminist pedagogical practices. I think we clearly demarcate the difference between um, the, the, those tensions and sort of acknowledge those tensions and see, try and build some bridges between the different approaches. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think that leads us on very nicely to the third question, which is about the transformative approaches. Um, and so I like this question very much from Adriana, who says, um, she'd love to hear more about the strategies, well, I suppose that both of you as panelists, but also in general in the report, what strategies have you come across to transformative approaches to training? What really um, stuck in your mind in terms of what kind of transformation, uh, transformative approaches are out there and what is being um, experimented with? I think this is a question for you, Lucy, more than me. I think that six months ago we would have answered the question differently um now we are struggling to come to terms with whereas before we were talking about what are the challenges of transformative training when we're in the same room with a group of people from an institution or a number of institutions what kinds of resistances come up there um what kinds of dynamics how do we make those dynamics as productive as possible, turn them into productive tensions for transformative change within an organization. Um, now we're just all looking at our screens, aren't we? Um, I think that we're doing our best. We are currently, as the training center, working on a paper on um, transformative feminist approaches to online training. Uh, we did a webinar on this earlier in the year. I don't think we have the answers. I think we just have to be really, continue to be as critical and self-reflexive as possible and maybe realistic with our with the limits of this online format for transformative training. 
um, many of the things that you can do in an in-person training, I'm daring to do, and I'm sure many of us are, in, a, in these online formats. And I think we should continue to do so. I think we need to be as bold and challenging as possible in these online formats. And yet um, within to be respecting people's comfort zones. I think we also need to be a lot more creative about what are the best ways to be, uh, to work towards transformative training in this new environment. And maybe this, maybe we need to change our formats and our style and think more about kind of question and answer sessions and the use of videos and how we can use visual methods. So uh, I would say there's definitely work in progress and we're working collectively now to try and um, to try and, and think about how how we tackle the new challenges for this kind of the, the, the training that we're now forced to do uh, in this situation. So thank you for the question. I'm not sure the answer is particularly satisfactory, but we're working on it. That's all I think. I think all we can say right now. Can I can I move to the next question? Because in a way, because in a way, I think that this is a very important one in as even in, in this current context. I at, at the end of my presentation talked about how can we work, how can training in, be more inclusive of uh, social movements, so uh, uh, women's voices, um, uh, and in 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 process that we call that I've called. Um, co-production where we work collaboratively not um, in, in across across institutions to train and I think when we're looking at things of traditions that impede rapid social changes this makes it particularly critical that we we listen to and collaborate in training with those who are working on these issues within their own contexts the example that comes from Africa and I think also at the sectoral level, for instance, the work of Groots in, in East Africa that works on land and land issues and looking at equality in rights to land is a, is a wonderful example of the way at a sectoral level, you can get an entry point to something that is a very traditional issue of land rights and land ownership, but in collaboration with local um, partners in these contexts. That's just my response to that question. That's an excellent response, Caroline. And I think that also feeds into the eighth question, which I've put on screen now, because since we're running out of time, I think we can't go through all of them. Yes. But if you see anything on screen that you particularly want to speak to, either Lucy or Caroline, um, we can speak about that or just in general. I know that we are receiving, I think, more questions now than we were receiving before. But uh, I'm not actually sure if I open them, whether they'll all suddenly be visible on screen. And um, I'll just briefly say if that's OK, following on from the previous session, going back to question eight here as well mm -hmm. uh, about the new environments that we're now working in. I think we all know the challenges of the digital divide, the digital gender divide. divide. Um, yeah, we have some serious issues here around how, how to make sure that we'll continue to be inclusive of this training. These, these new modes of training. However, I think we should also try and think about the, um, the positives and the potential, not necessarily the positives, but the potential of the new situation, considering you now will be working like this for some considerable time. And I think the fact that budgets for travel are no longer required is an opportunity to make trainings more inclusive. So for example, in terms of being a transformative online training, we have more opportunities now to invite people from working all over the world to join our trainings, to share their experiences without having to fork out huge um, budgets for travel and also the, the climate impact of that travel. So we need to start being as creative as we can with bringing in and reaching out and making sure that there are lots of opportunities for these uh, uh, global interactions in these trainings, which previously might have been done in a room in Brussels or New York. We can think about how we, how we change the dynamics of how we run trainings. Um, I, just, I just want to end by saying that I, I, I'd i like the message from me that comes through at the end of this is to say how critically important gender training still is 
in a world where not everybody sees this as important. And I think that, that the role of the UN Women's Center and uh, a training center collaboratively with others is an absolutely critical um, institution that we all need to uh, support and recognize. And I hope this, con this continues and then we'll have a very good report in another five years. Thank you. I certainly hope so. Thank you so much, Caroline. And thank you so much, Lucy. I know that um, we've hit the hour mark almost. And uh, I know that everyone has to has to leave by, um, well, by the hour. Um, so I wanted to thank you both and Clementia as well very much. And to all our participants who have been so vociferous and they have sent in so many wonderful questions. Um, and so what we're going to do now is um, you can see on your screens right now, this is our website. And um, if you click on resources right at the top, you can visit all our resources, including this paper uh, on Beijing plus 25. You can see right there that uh, re the review report is highlighted in our news. And you can also join the community of practice by looking at um, communities where you can continue these discussions. So all these wonderful questions that you've posed today, um, we can just keep discussing them because as Caroline said, and as Lucy has said, training for gender equality has really never been so important. And we need to take this opportunity of all the online fora that we have to um, you know, continue the debate. And what we're going to do with today's webinar is I'm going to write up a summary of all the points that Caroline and Lucy have made. And we're going to credit all of you and include all of your questions. And we're going to post that as well on our resource center. So I just wanna thank you all so much for joining us today. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you, Lucy. Thank you, Clemencia. And thank you all of our um, participants. And uh, we wish you all a wonderful day. And we hope to have many more discussions like this on the importance of training. And we hope that everyone will read the report on Patient Plus 25. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.